I try to show um, how we brought together this paradigm, this multi-sensory paradigm of, that is called visual tactile, so this double stimulation, visual, or this dissociation of perception that is visual and tactile with uh, architectonic interiors. And, um, So to start with from architecture, again, this ideal of, of, uh, of the module of this, this architectonic shelter and this interior space we relate to and that can develop a certain architectonic presence as it has been described in architectonic literature so that architecture has seems to have a being of its own, a logic of its own, which is external to our body. This is one aspect that, uh, that uh, one can find in architecture. And the next one, of course, is architecture as the space which augments uh, human as a society, which brings us together in public space. So urban space is another, another side of, of wanting to study architecture. And it, I mean, it's not new, we have seen this before, that embodiment has uh, started to be a rather scientific notion uh, since the Quattrocento, uh, where you s there have been several representations. You saw another one in uh, Olaf Blanke's presentation in which um, architects tried to represent make a representation of architecture through the body and vice versa. So this double influence or this double question, does architecture represent the body in a way as a very ancient theory says from Vitruvius on in architecture, or is architecture influencing us? So is it inscribed into the body? And um, uh, this we find back later on uh, in modern science, very related notions. So you have the Mach perspective, in which, as you see in the representation, we imagine the human body almost like a volume, as there was someone living in the body, as if the body was a house. And um, in the second representation uh, by Graziano, you see again peripersonal space, in which the space of the body is more like a bubble that I engage through my body, that I generate myself by interacting with space and my body develops a certain notion of the surrounding space. So you see that it's for different ways of interacting with space, you get different kinds, sorts of bubbles that are more pronounced for certain body parts as we heard before. And um, our research hypothesis is then built on these two interactions of the body with space and space with the body. So that sounds a bit weird as if space was able to recognize ourselves, but actually, I mean, it's also a very ancient um, uh, notion of, in, of um, uh, um, the vision, whether the vision is a projection of ourselves to the environment or the environment is a projection on vision. So it is a very ancient notion. And you see that uh, what was called before, uh, on top by Fisher, a sympathetic projection. So the question, how do I see the person in front from my own perspective? So my left is the other right and my right is the other left. Um, would be a projection of the person on a form, on an object. And in the second case, what you see is Wölflin's interpretation of it, which is empathetic, so it involves a 180 degree rotation in the sense that then my right becomes the other right, so that the object is reverberating in myself. So this is, this is a slight change between the two. So the first one was a sympathetic projection, and the second one is truly an empathetic projection, which has been translated into English only later in psychological terms. So basically, the term of empathy, which is today used in sociology and in psychology as related to interpersonal exchange, comes from art and, and architecture. Only that architects have forgotten this uh, for many decades. And um, 
there is a, a third notion built on top of this, which is based on the sense of, of space, in German Raumgefühl, and the sense of shelter, based on the fact that humans have developed inside the shelter and have developed a notion of orientation inside this architectonic volume. So this theory draws back to the, the, the ancient idea of the module, of the, the theory of the perfection of the architectonic module. And uh, in fact, it relates also a lot to contemporary notions of immersion. So being immersed in a space, being here, and, and experiencing the, spur, the space as it is. And um, to illustrate that, I'm showing two quick images of my own work. I am an architect, and um, this is how I got interested in, the, in this idea. So the model or the, the, the object as something which mediates between a space that can be immersed within and uh, an object in the landscape, forming an object for humans. And the second one, again, also through digital media, the representation, an immersive representation, and then this external view of the environment as an object. Uh, these are two views which should be very important for architects to be mediated, only that we have very few or very little tools to do so. Basically, the main tool is our body, is our self. So we stand inside our project and somehow decide intuitively based on, on our own experience of the image and of our ideas. And um, this is also how it has been for many hundreds of years, you see, uh, Vignola's representation of perspective in which, uh, crucially, the architect is overlooking the inhabitant and the object and space. So perspective is something which is thought to mediate between these uh, two ways of inhabiting. So the, the, the exterior perspective of the object and then the immersed perspective. And here I also want um, to pronounce it this way because it's really this uh, visual Wölflin perspective of the object and this Schmarzo vision of the interior. And it's probably not an either or, it's both and. So it should happen at the same time. It shouldn't be two rivalizing concepts. It's really something that should go together. Next to what maybe was before a projection of a metaphor or of the symbol into the environment as some sort of proportion. So the idea of proportion is changing into maybe an idea of scale, where you have several scales um, playing together, working together. And, uh, at this point, we also come to the research that we have done at the lab, working with differently scaled environments. You see a large space and then a very narrow space. We had a flexible wall, and uh, the idea here of this space is that the walls are within this peripersonal space, of which you will hear more later on by Andrea Serino, so that the walls are within grasping space. They are close to the body, but they do not touch the body. While here in the first image, you see that they are at visual distance. So it's more a visual space which is being engaged. And in our hypothesis, of course, the wall in peripersonal space becomes more of an object. And this is more like of a situation in which you are immersed with certain, hypothetically, with certain neurological implications as well, which would be shown for instance, in our visual task that we have developed. So we made participants uh, performing um, length estimations. You see that the bar is in the middle. So before the experiment, they had to memorize a 50 centimeters bar. And then after the full body illusion, after the stimulation, uh, which could be uh, synchronous or asynchronous, they had to estimate whether this bar which they could see only in 2D, was longer or shorter. And it appeared that only in the narrow space, which is here, only in the narrow space, you can see it here, the asynchronous condition, uh, they saw it much shorter. So it means that for the large space, for visual space, it didn't matter. It was exactly the same. 
but in the narrow space where eventually there was an interference with the walls and, and the embodiment was affected by this condition, um, the visual tactile stimulation helped to estimate uh, this bar more in a more realistic way. And um, we did then a second experiment to test, in fact, whether the body visualized in space uh, affects this perspective or whether we could, like previous research has shown, for instance, by Ramachandran, whether we could say that architecture in itself, so the walls in itself, would be sufficient to evoke this embodied cognition. So am I in an empty module enough or are the walls enough to stimulate a more embodied position? So we um, proposed an augmentation of a virtual reality arena. You see it here. It's a physical space with a front projection and we used again a technique from the Cinquecento where a perspective painting is used to simulate uh, the nave because there was too little space. So in our case, we simulated for the large space the prolongation of the virtual reality interior with avatar. And in the second condition, we just proposed a, a narrow prolongation of the interior. And then again, an empty space means without avatar. So we asked, here we asked mainly questions <clears throat> and we got a lot of responses in the sense that people felt, I can show you rather the, the effects, in the sense that people, they felt uh, with the avatar, they felt a drift towards the avatar. And uh, in the narrow space, it was more linked to this visual tactile stimulation. So there was a connection, for instance, with the uh, stability of the position, which was drawing people into space. Or in the large space, there was more a backward drift of the avatar. So this was an effect of the large space. And we assume that this is due to the fact that eventually perspective cues were weaker, but also there was uh, less visual um, support so that the personal space would withdraw. This could be like the personal space, the pro this transposition into space, which is collapsing, and the avatar is seen as drifting backward. And the third effect that we found, but based on synchrony, so independent, whether people were standing in the large space or in the small space, they felt that the side walls were slowly getting closer. So this, this uh, enclosure was becoming more physical and eventually they were even feeling touched by it. So the visual tactile stimulation with this figure, with this very generic avatar in front, it was just a, a white body, um, this, um, this visual tactile stimulation would give a more substantial touch feeling with the walls and with the room. Um, in the same experiment you see performed without avatar, this all disappeared. The only effect that remained was this sense of presence in the, in the environment. So that it seems that seeing a body can affect also the vision of space and, uh, and vice versa that sit here, that this, this visual tactile stimulation also uh, was perceived, it unfolded, the synchronous stimulation unfolded this 3D space or the augmentation, while in the asynchronous stimulation this didn't happen. So, so basically, we could say that the, seeing the avatar in space would evoke a more situated, so seeing another person in the space would evoke a more situated transposition, the possibility to engage myself in another space, to embody another space, while in a, uh, when there was just a visual tactile augmentation of the front wall, the stroking of the front wall, I would see the space, but I wouldn't be transported into the space. So I, the embodiment of the space was much weaker. 
So at this point, one could ask how is this related to emotion? The question that Wölflin and others had asked was related to how can architecture evoke an emotional response? And this, of course, doesn't, doesn't go that far. This is the question more, how does the body engage uh, with architecture? And if one looks in literature, um, for instance, Damasio, who has uh, written extensively about emotion, so uh, one of his theories says that we need a body to feel emotions. So basically that it is through the body that we can also engage into, have an emotional engagement, that it takes a body to become conscious of, of the emotion. And in this sense, consciousness is a form of knowledge that we gain through the body. Um, so the question is, how can we, can we get there with architecture? Is it possible that maybe architecture on a very intuitive level gives us such answers and uh, speaks for instance, through surface textures or lights, or for instance here in, um, in uh, Giornico by Peter Merkel with uh, representations of the body that you also see are as objects in space, but also as textures on the walls. Is it, is it a way of answering to a certain search of humans to relate to space on an emotional level and in what way? A second example for this would be mentioned by Arnheim in um, the dynamic of architectural form, the moment when he enters the Statue of Liberty and he's puzzled by this, this uh, very faceted interior which is so much different from this conclusive exterior shape and also engaged the constructivist architects in uh, studying this relationship of interior and exterior. So, and related to emotion and, and the sense of shelter. Um, so how could we approach that? And we tried through an interoceptive paradigm, a cardiovisual paradigm, uh, in a mini cave, uh, wearing earphones and uh, shutter glasses, you see a 3D image of an interior projected into the mini cave. So with difference to the first experiment, you get full sight of your own body, which in the first experiment was concealed through the, the head-mounted display. So here you stand in the room, still view it through a technology, and uh, participants are <coughs> connected to some shapes that are glowing in the room through their own heartbeat. So here, the synchronous condition is synchronous with your own heartbeat. And in one case, we have projected body-like shapes that are disposed like texture on the wall. And in the second condition, more like a uh, blob-like shape that are similar to it. So very similar images um, to see whether and what kind of emotions they could evoke and whether they would evoke any emotions at all. And uh, then, of course, there was an asynchronous condition in which for one group the heartbeat was much slower and for the other group it was much faster. So we had this factorial <coughs> design. And um, for the responses that we could expect, since you would look at the difference of the heartbeats while uh, participants were stimulated during these two minutes, would the heartbeat rate increase or not? So we would look at the interbeat interval between two heartbeats. Would this augment or would this uh, become slower, smaller. So uh, high, a high interbeat interval um, means changes in low heart rate, so the people would be more, we'd expect people to be more relaxed, while um, high heart rate spectra would induce smaller changes, so the people would be more excited. So what we get when looking at our data is in fact, uh, here you have the 120% group and here you have the 80% group. So 
what you see immediately, and this we have found also previously in other, um, in other experiments that when stimulated at 80%, actually people also identify, like to identify with the, the lower heart rate. While when uh, showing them an increased and augmented heart rate, you see here that there is a, actually a difference between object and the body, in the sense that for the bodies in the asynchronous condition, um, you have a much higher uh, interbeat interval, so that people were much more relaxed. This could in be interpreted in that way. And um, you see again that the asynchronous condition in itself would induce a decrease in identification. So what we can, uh, in, uh, with, the, with the flashing volume, so what we can get from this is the fact that people decreased in identification and get also more relaxed um, when the bodies were not seen in, in synchrony, flashing in synchrony. So one question is, could be what is the difference between the bodies beyond synchrony and asynchrony? What we want to know is the difference between the bodies and the blobs in a way. What, what difference does it make whether I see a human body shape or, or bodily-like shape in space and uh, an abstract shape? So again, we had these two questions which always appeared throughout the studies, even when they were very different. <coughs> uh, but this interior of the room in this case was drifting backwards, not the avatar anymore. So this time it was the interior, and then secondly, that people were feeling touched by these shapes. Uh, so you have a big difference for the bodies and the objects, and the synchrony doesn't interfere so much, so it depended only on viewing the bodies in the sense that for the bodies these two ap uh, effects were absent and uh, for the objects they were present in the, for the touch a bit weaker but stronger for, um, for the drift. And secondly, we found a relatively weak, but we still found a response concerning happiness in that the faster um, heart rate uh, would induce overall an increased happiness. So people that saw the whole scene um, in fa faster or with increased speed, um, they would be more happy overall also for the synchronous condition. There is a, still a study going on for um, this. We are still making control <coughs> tests to understand whether it is necessary that it's your own heartbeat which is increased or whether it could be just another faster heart rate. So the question at this point is how could we introduce all these technologies to, um, on the one hand, bring values from the past into some future representations. So could we inhabit virtual reality? Could we use virtual reality or technological media to inhabit architecture? Can architecture be augmented um, with technology? This is one question. And the second question is how could we also recognize or generate public spaces um, that allow us to connect together in a space, for instance, with using virtual reality and augmenting the space. This is one way of reflecting on it. And also concerning values like surrealism, I mean, digital te technologies are offering us uh, multiple ways to, to change space and to, to modify space to our needs. So the question is how can we engage an emotional approach to these spaces and how can we engage a more emotional approach to, to the construction of space 
and to the perception of space so that when it affects us, the day it, it, the, this effect comes back, it will be a positive effect. So this is how we would like to continue these studies in order to integrate technology and to find also a better use for technology uh, for construction and also science for constructing more humane spaces and uh, improve the quality of spaces. I would like to thank the LNCO for the support and also the Cogito Foundation for supporting the second study that you have seen. Thank you very much.